Until the 1940s, we learned about events mainly by reading or hearing about them after they happened. But now, with the advent of live satellite television, we've become eyewitnesses to events as they happen, and all because of an astonishing revolution in television technology, a revolution that began in the early 1960s with the first live satellite transmission between the United States and Europe. This is a CBS News Extra. Transatlantic TV, live to Europe. Good evening, Europe. This is the North American Continent Live via AT&T Telstar, July 23rd, 1962, 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time in the East. The New York skyline on the Atlantic Ocean. Hello, North America. July the 23rd, 1962. And the time on the face of Big Ben in the heart of London at this very moment, little less than two minutes to 11. Suddenly, Washington and Moscow had become next-door neighbors. What happened in the UN could now be seen live in any European capital. We in television are convinced that the ability to portray immediacy, to realize what's new, what's going on, is the true significance of this new communications bridge. This is CBS News live coverage of what's happening in the wee hours of the morning in Moscow. You're looking at a live picture right now where we think O.J. Simpson very close uh, up ahead of us. Ed. Dan Rather reporting live from Beijing, China. The best thing about live television coverage is it takes you there. It transports you there. It is the proverbial magic carpet. This is Alan Kuzi in Baghdad. There's nothing more authentic and authoritative than a live image. And people believe it. And uh, the notion that a, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, a live television picture is probably worth ten million words. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. It really is. If human beings had walked around on the moon and there'd been no TV camera there, it wouldn't really have happened for most people. They would, you know, it would be more of a rumor than, than anything else. And um, a still photo doesn't quite do it either. I thought never in human history have so many people shared the same moment, shared the same tongue, no matter what the language of astonishment might be. A few dark days in November of 1963 demonstrated what live television could become. Television, it was agreed then, brought the nation together and helped hold the nation together. The long, sad session wends its way through the streets of Washington. Kennedy assassination, its coverage is the first time I can remember when such an event was covered on such a broad and deep world scale, partly because satellite technology had just begun to come into play. Today, television has become the first place people go when a crisis occurs. Mobile and miniaturized TV equipment produces live pictures from the scene almost as fast as rescue workers can arrive. Wow. Holy cow. About a third of the building has been blown away. When a bomb destroyed the federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995, the cameras got there in minutes and the pictures were instantly broadcast around the world. This is a rescue from the Alfred P. Murrow building. You can see a firefighter helping a man down a ladder. It looks like from the third or fourth floor. You okay, sir? Yeah. That was quite, quite miraculous. Thank, thank God, I'm alive. We're getting some really bad news. Just in from Heidi Browning on the scene, children at this hour are being pulled out of the Alfred Murrah building. We have not confirmed the severity of their injuries or whether there are fatalities, including children. It was a car bomb that ripped through a nine, ripped a nine-story hole in the federal office building downtown, killing, now we're told, at least 19 people, and here's the really bad news, including 17 children among the 19 dead. It's awful hard on the officers and everybody that's had to bring the bodies out, and the people that are tagging, and just in general everybody. It's like a war zone down there. 
In a crisis like the Oklahoma City bombing, television helps bring us together. You can be alone, but you can share with your friends, neighbors, the community, and indeed the nation as a whole, the feeling. Television adds to our sense of community, helps hold us together as a society, as a people, and gives us a, a great sense of shared experience when it's a big event that touches everybody. We've just been fixated on it all day long, and uh, all of us have been looking at the scenes where those children were taken out. We were all of us seeing our own children there. That's what I felt as a person. I think that's what the American people uh, will feel. But drawing us together in times of crisis is only part of the story because television can also help us to act as a caring community. None of us will ever forget some of those pictures on television. The picture of hundreds of people standing in line to give blood. The work of the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and a host of other humanitarian organizations, as well as the emergency workers and the doctors and the nurses, have inspired us and humbled us. The pictures inspired people from around the world, from metropolis to village, to send money to offer help. It's not just man-made terror that brings us together. Live pictures from scenes of fires and floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, often provide our first news of a disaster and our first impulse to help. Scenes of the hurricane's enormous destruction are shocking thousands of Americans into action. Water for Florida is coming from Minneapolis, food from Union City, New Jersey. South Florida needs the simple things, things most of America takes for granted. But live television doesn't just focus on the big events that affect thousands of lives. Good evening. We go directly to Midland, Texas, where the long hours of waiting and hoping, the hours of tension, may be almost over. There is uh, activity around the hole where little Jessica McClure has been stuck down an old dry well for more, more than 48 hours. It's hard to imagine that very many people, other than the residents of Midland, Texas, would have cared when 18-month-old Jessica McClure got stuck in an abandoned well. But when live television cameras rushed to the scene, an audience of millions was instantly created. This story is receiving tremendous worldwide play uh, in newspapers and uh, radio and television stations. Uh, Hong Kong, both English and Chinese language stations are carrying reports on the girl. Dan, it looks like they're getting ready to bring something up from the hole. I can't tell. They're tightening the slack on the cable and people are moving in very very close to the uh, hole. There are different moments right when for some reason people fix on some experience as usually somebody being trapped um, and it something rings a bell for them. It's, you know it's a complicated feeling because part of it is empathy and feeling and part of it is also I think unconsciously relief it's happening to somebody else somewhere far from me and it's not really happening to my child. The outcome wasn't known in the in the baby Jessica story. Uh, there was a baby in the well and she might live and she might die and so there was that sense of expectation and drama, a tremendous drama. Here she comes, there's clapping. and direct from Midland, Texas, Jessica McClure is up. She's alive. What a fighter. Because of the vast audience live worldwide television provides, people like young Jessica McClure can become celebrities overnight. And sometimes celebrities in their own right can become the stars of live news events. And we break into the CBS Evening News right now to bring you the very latest on the police search for the fugitive O.J. Simpson. Apparently, the police think they may be getting closer to, to apprehending Simpson. They think he is in a white uh, Ford Bronco down in Orange County with his friend Al Cowling. When ex-football player, Hollywood movie star O.J. Simpson failed to turn himself into police after being charged with the murders of his ex-wife and her friend, no one could have predicted the frenzy that followed. Okay, you're looking at a live picture right now where we think O.J. Simpson very close uh, up ahead of us. Right now, we all, we all okay, but you got to tell the police to just back off. He's still alive, but he's got a gun to his head. So what we have here is a suicidal man, uh, O.J. Simpson, with a gun to his head. Units on the five. Is there units that can cover the five? If you asked someone if they would 
could imagine any situation where millions of people would watch a car moving at 35 or 40 miles an hour down a freeway for many hours because they thought something might happen at the end, they would say you were crazy. But in fact, our country and the world did that. There's people standing on the side of the road waving as O.J. goes by. Ground level yeah. shot there, and you can hear people cheering, cheering from the sideline. It's very bizarre. The uh, Friday night on the freeways uh, with the white Bronco was one of those amazing events which seemed to have been organized as a TV movie, and yet it, it had real power. What can only be described as an amazing sight, football hero, celebrity O.J. Simpson, driving down Sunset Boulevard, westbound, coming up into Brentwood, making a left turn on Ashford, left turn in Ashford. He's going to run into a bunch of news crews standing by, standing by at his home. There are Los Angeles police units standing by there as well. This is insane. I've never seen anything like this. Mr. Simpson, OJ, please. He's now pulling into his residence. So the OJ Simpson slow car chase uh, was rather boring television, yet it was fascinating television because people didn't know what was going to happen. Not knowing the outcome gives live television extraordinary appeal, drama. No one knew what the outcome would be in the spring of 1993 when the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms botched a raid on a previously little known religious sect outside Waco, Texas. Four law enforcement agents are dead and at least 12 injured in a shootout with a religious cult. About 100 agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and local police officers surrounded a ranch occupied by about 75 members of the cult called the Branch Davidians. The botch raid quickly turned into a standoff between the religious sect and the FBI. In the cold and rain of the Texas countryside, the standoff continues as federal negotiators attempt to talk cult leaders out of their fortified compound. What happens in law enforcement is rarely seen by the public. Very little of it we ever get. And here was a case where the entire scenario was playing out before our eyes over a very long period of time. Played out in front of a massive media presence. Hundreds of reporters from around the world are camped around the clock about a mile from the compound at the intersection of two Texas farm roads waiting for the next move in a drama that has echoed to the far corners of the world. It was a presence both sides in the standoff could hardly ignore. In the cult siege near Waco, Texas, cult members have found a new way to communicate with the rest of the world. They unfurled two homemade banners yesterday, one reading, God help us, we want the press. Because of the sea of cameras, the FBI felt compelled to give press briefings on the status of the siege. We are going through a very frustrating and disappointing period in the negotiation process. Day after day, the suspense built. This was day 16 of the standoff in Central Texas between... So the federal standoff is now into day 20 with federal authorities saying... Beginning the fifth week of the marathon standoff, an armored tank rolled in... There is still no sign of a break in the 41-day standoff near Waco, Texas. With constant coverage of the continuing stalemate, the feeling began to grow that the FBI was preparing for more direct action. That many, many days before the tragic climax happened, there was, a, I thought, a palatable sense of foreboding of, boy, this, this is not going to turn out well. There's no way this can turn out well. Now, once you see the FBI with tanks, then uh, I think the sense of foreboding became overwhelming. Just about five minutes ago, we saw tanks continuing to batter the compound, continuing to put gaping holes into the walls of the structure. We saw what looked like white, wispy smoke coming out, which usually is indicative of tear gas. And then suddenly, out of one of the second floor windows, flames burst forth. And as you can see, it looks like at this point like the entire compound is just engulfed in flames. Right now, we do have a whole convoy of emergency vehicles coming up this road, leading up there. This looks like probably the fire chief and fire marshals, and we have, at this point, two fire engines. That was two emergency vehicles preceded by what, like, what looked like two fire chief's cars. I can tell you that we also have more coming up the road in just a minute. Because so many people died when the compound went up in flames, 
There was a lot of soul-searching about whether there might have been another outcome had the FBI just waited. In fact, questions linger to this day about what effect all those cameras had on the FBI's decision to go in. For those who want to argue that the presence uh, of coverage, massive coverage, uh, television, radio, and print, but primarily television, can change an event because it affects the minds of the people who are making decisions about the event, then Waco probably is as good a case study as you're going to find. Whether television cameras affect the events they're covering is a question that was raised first during race riots and the anti-Vietnam demonstrations of the late 60s. It was a question that took on new urgency in 1992 when Los Angeles exploded in the worst urban rioting in a quarter century. But unlike the 60s, a single handheld video camera was central to the events that led to the conflagration in Los Angeles. In the case of the LA riots, a little snippet of the Rodney King videotape had been shown again and again and again. An amateur with a camcorder had captured pictures of Rodney King being brutally beaten by white police officers. Many people who had seen the tape thought the outcome of the trial of the police officers was a foregone conclusion, but they were wrong. The jury in the Los Angeles police brutality trial late today reached its verdicts. The four police officers who were videotaped repeatedly beating an unarmed man were found not guilty on all but one count. It was on film. We saw him beating that man. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. And we're not going to stand for it. No more Rodney King. No more Rodney King. No more Rodney King. No more Rodney King. No more I think when the verdict came down, that seemed uh, so, uh, so much counter to what people had seen with their own eyes, they thought, that that, that led to... Uh, uh, to riots. Within two hours of the verdict, pictures of rioters torching Los Angeles were being broadcast live around the world. It is a spontaneous effect that takes place when something's live, and people's reaction is, is far more visceral, far more immediate than it would be if it's something that happened two days ago and you, uh, you have a different attitude about that. You might be upset and outraged, but I don't think you have the passion that they have at, at the very moment these things occur. There have been riots uh, of looting downtown, but right now what I want to show you is they have started fires down at the end of the street. That's where the crowd has, they've kind of made a circle downtown. They went through, looted the Justice Building, City Hall, breaking buildings, and there were several police officers drawing their guns. This is the latest stuff that was shot by the, uh, the CBS crew that have been roving down there, and they said that they have hit every single building in the downtown area. The only one was bleeding is Rodney King, you know what I'm saying? It's all for him, you know what I'm saying? Peace, Rodney King, peace! The pictures broadcast across the country created a climate of fear in many other cities. Could it happen here, people asked. Fact was, in some places, it did. In Las Vegas, police found a body in the burned rubble of a shopping center after a mob set fires last night and shot at people. In Seattle, groups of young people overturned cars, set fires, smashed windows. In city after city, bottled up anger exploded in violence. Tampa, Birmingham, Toledo, San Francisco. Oh, there's fire up here! Look it, look it! We're, we gotta go live. It's probably the case that when a riot is uh, reported nationally and given so much attention that it inflames feelings that already exist uh, in other cities. It doesn't invent the feelings but it inflames them, because live television especially is, is sort of an invitation. It says, you know, this is happening. If you do act, then you're part of, of something bigger. Television has become a medium that often brings us together, but its vivid display of Rodney King's beating shocked us. And the America it has shown us on our screens these last 48 hours has appalled us. Appalling, yes, and full of lingering questions. Among them, 
What effect live coverage had on the riots and the rioters? Well, historically, uh, and going back to the uh, urban riots of the 1960s, people performed for the cameras. Some people were just uh, so much caught up in this, they weren't uh, that aware of the cameras. But those who were, uh, were aware, I think, uh, were very much influenced by the cameras and planned their actions, antics, and activities around television coverage. The advent of satellite technology brought television's unique perspective into virtually every corner of the globe. With that kind of reach, almost every political actor on the world stage, from South Africa to China, recognized and then tried to exploit its power. When the Western media came to Beijing in 1989 to cover a summit between two old enemies, China and the Soviet Union, Chinese students rallying for democracy used the media, used television, to great effect. <laughs> Good evening, Dan Rather reporting live from Beijing, China. What a place, what a time, what a story. It's Friday morning here, and this is Tiananmen Square, the symbolic center of the People's Republic of China. Today, it's the People's Square, all right. More than a million Chinese demanding democracy and freedom and proclaiming the new revolution. <laughs> They were certainly conscious of the cameras, and they were certainly conscious that the whole world was watching them. They had everything on the line, let's remember. For these students, this was not a game, and this wasn't just a spring lark. Their lives were literally on the line, and so they brought into play any and everything that they thought would help their cause. We want democracy. We want freedom. They applaud whenever a new group marches in, but this applause was for us, for the CBS News camera crew. The students believe very strongly that a free press in China and abroad will help their cause. The political actors around the world are increasingly sophisticated about media use. Uh, they're increasingly aware that they have to get not only their message, but especially images of themselves uh, out in order to be visible on the world stage. The students seemed particularly perceptive about who was watching their demonstrations. Oh, CBS, oh, yeah. Columbia Com Broadcast System, right. yeah, right. I see. And they seemed acutely aware that their audience extended far outside the borders of China. Some of their posters, in fact, some of their chants, were <laughs> One, in English. Two, three. Join us! One, two, three. Join us! One, two, three. Join us! As journalists, we all too often sometimes say, well, this is an exciting and momentous occasion and historic occasion. This time I have a feeling we may actually be right about that. And it has a spontaneity and authenticity that is unique. It occurred to me that so often our cameras are accused, and rightly so, of distorting an, an event, making it seem larger than it really is. This time, it seems to me, that our cameras are not large enough to take in the scope and importance of this. As the number of protesters grew, Chinese government officials wrangled over how to handle the demonstrations, and at the end, the hardliners won out. They imposed strict censorship on the international press and banned live satellite coverage of the ongoing events in Tiananmen Square. Final pictures we're showing here are of the uh, what limited violence there have been and considerable chaos in uh, downtown Beijing. Uh, these are the last pictures we'll be showing to you uh, through our own facilities, and if we're able to show any more at all, I, uh, I know not when. Uh, this is Dan Rather, uh, CBS News, Beijing. But pulling the plug on live transmissions had little effect on the coverage. The international press simply shipped their stories to other locations in the Far East for transmission back to the United States. And reporters continued to file live reports from the scene by cellular phone, which was then recycled back to the demonstrators in China. There is a, a loop of information, a conveyor belt of information that is looped. And you could see it and hear it and feel it very clearly at the time of Tiananmen Square. As friends and relatives of the demonstrators watched the news in the United States, they would then telephone or fax or email the latest to the demonstrators back in China. 
the picture I have in my mind of these old communist leaders saying, what's happening? We pull the switch to shut down the information, but this information is getting out. Aware that the world was still watching, the students never flagged in presenting images designed for Western consumption. They did feel that as long as the whole world was watching, that they had at least a, an additional layer of protection. Having said that, they had no illusions. China was and is China. And time finally ran out for the demonstrators. Gunfire. Fire, we do hear it. Okay, we've got to get out of here. They're just they're after Derek now. They're ripping away his camera. They're ripping away his camera and they're coming for us. We're trying to move move back and move away. This is a CBS News special report. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Bob Schieffer. And we want to go immediately to Richard Roth in Tiananmen Square. The troops were moving toward him at last report. What's happening, Dick? We have just lost communication with Richard Roth. Hello, this is New York. Does someone hear us there? Hello, this is New York. Does anybody hear us? Correspondent Roth was ultimately released, but an untold number of demonstrators were killed. Deaths that in the tightly sealed China of the past would have gone unreported because no one would have known about them. Let's face it, the old line, hard line communist leaders came up in a world and believed erroneously that they were still operating in a world where they control the information. In the new world, murder will out. In the old world, you could kill people as Stalin did in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, and no one would ever know, really know, what had gone on. The new way, the new world, murder will out. <laughs> Today, all over the world, people protested and raged and cried. In Bonn, they burned an army uniform. Massacre, the banners read. In Moscow, Moscow, a quiet protest. In Washington, D.C., marchers and a defaced flag and protest. Outside the United Nations, which cannot intervene in China's internal killings, chants and marchers. Here and everywhere, tears and anger, grief and rage, all mingled. The whole world was watching. It will never see China quite the same way again. The explosion of continent-hopping satellite television, together with Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev's desperate scramble to save communism by liberalizing it, had profoundly unexpected consequences. By 1989, not only were Eastern European countries declaring their independence from Moscow at what seemed the speed of light, but even more astonishing, the Berlin Wall, that apparently permanent symbol of the Cold War, was erased almost overnight. The eyes of the world, with every reason, are riveted here tonight at the wall. Until yesterday, the wall was a symbol of Cold War fear and loathing. Tonight. It's the scene for a celebration of freedom, peace, and love. I think satellite television had an enormous impact on the end of the Cold War. People in Eastern Europe uh, knew what was happening in the next country. Uh, people in Moscow and elsewhere saw what was happening in, in Poland and, and that sort of thing. And while the West applauded, there was also growing concern about a possible backlash from the old guard inside the Soviet Union. This late-breaking story from Moscow, the official Soviet news agency TASS, 
says that Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev is no longer the head of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev has apparently been dumped in a coup. At first, the attempt to oust Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev in 1991 had the feel of countless other Russian coups. Swift, silent, secret. Soviet television that day had only symphony orchestras and ballets on, and so the only source of information to the outside world was live television. Because the coup leaders claimed it was a legal transfer of power, they allowed Western media to continue to operate. The Western media during the Moscow coup uh, told the rest of the world what was going on in a way that never would have been possible previously in the old Soviet Union. Sizing up just what's going on outside of Moscow in the vast Soviet hinterland is very difficult. We do know this, Dan. Some of that live television got out into the Soviet Union itself and was watched in international hotels and elsewhere. And people in the streets were actually interviewing tourists who they knew had access to CNN through international hotels. A news conference held by the coup leaders revealed just how much the world inside the Soviet Union had changed. Instead of simply accepting the story put out by the coup leaders, a no longer docile press challenged the plotters at every turn. And so instead of appearing in charge, the coup leaders looked old and tired, confused. The people who perpetrated the coup in Moscow were very bad at public relations. They didn't control the reporters. Uh, they stupidly thought they could uh, finesse them, and they were wrong. And so they look not just like uh, bad guys, but like incompetent bad guys. By contrast, Russian President Boris Yeltsin made the power of television work for him in opposing the coup. Yeltsin didn't just issue a statement opposing the coup leaders. He climbed atop a tank outside the Russian parliament to proclaim his defiance. Yeltsin became a dramatic symbol during the Moscow coup. and He was a, a visual image and a great symbol of freedom of expression and, and resistance. And pictures of his courageous act were carried on television both inside and outside Russia. The crucial thing in Russia was that the media stayed with Yeltsin. <laughs> if the media had cut away, they could have dampened Yeltsin's magnetism and his aura of being the carrier of democratic Russia. Yeltsin's televised defiance became a rallying point for thousands of Russians who converged on the Russian parliament. There, they dared army units to fire on them. After a tense standoff with the army, the soldiers backed down. Three days after the coup began, it collapsed. Among the reasons, Boris Yeltsin's understanding of the power of images to move people. Not always, but sometimes, appearance matches the reality. Yeltsin was at that moment the strongest leader in the Soviet Union. That's how he played, that's what the image was, and that's the reason he came out on top. The others uh, were far less in their ability to command center stage, to articulate their goals, uh, to exercise leadership, and that's one of the reasons they failed. The coup plotters were totally befuddled by the new world of live satellite transmission and by the free flow of information. Adolf Hitler said, he who controls the images controls the race. It's no longer possible to completely control the images in the way that Hitler did. I mean, you can't control the images anymore, and you can't completely control the race. The effort to control images was a calculated strategy in the planning that went into the Persian Gulf War. And keep your eye on all sides of the building as the airplane overflies the building and drops the bomb down through the center of the building. Now, it's war, and anybody's military, if not forgiven, at least it can be understood that they want to control the images because their ultimate desire is triumph, is victory, it's to win. What reinforced the military's desire to control images 
was its catastrophic experience in Vietnam. There, a relatively unfettered press corps sent home graphic images of casualties, which contributed to the country's souring on the war. Hey, hey, how many dead? How many dead killed today? And the military vowed that would not happen with the Persian Gulf conflict. Let me, let me tell you how we did this. The public uh, got a pretty good sense of what was going on in terms of the overall strategy of the war. I don't think there was uh, a lot of misleading material there. They got very little sense of the human aspects and the costs of the war. What kind of weapon is that? That was a CBU-87 referred to as a uh, cluster bomb munition. It was a very narrow scope, and so that tended to reinforce public opinion. Which was exactly what the U.S. government wanted. We support the president! From the war zone, late reports from all along the front lines indicate that the massive U.S.-led ground war offensive has begun to roll. In many ways, the war was unique. For the first time in history, parts of the war were shown live on television. I believe we are hearing sirens again. The air base here is under attack. It was then that the cable news network on the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week, came into its own. The, the best reporting that I've seen on uh, what transpired in Baghdad was on CNN. Because it was so widely available, not only in the United States, but around the world, it became more than just a source of information. This is Alan Cousy in Baghdad. The streets of Baghdad are During the Gulf War, live television was not just television oriented to a general audience, but it was a source of intelligence for people in embassies, for government leaders in the United States, in Iraq, everywhere in the world. All of the allies were uh, watching, and certainly uh, leadership recognizing that conducted it as a television war. Both President Bush and Saddam Hussein used television not only to communicate with their countrymen, but also with each other. Iraq will not be permitted to annex Kuwait. And that's not a threat, it's not a boast, that's just the way it's going to be. He called President Bush the Satan of the White House. The attempt to use television didn't stop with the two leaders. The U.S. military tried to use the news media to deceive the Iraqis. Just before the ground offensive began, they tried to convince the Iraqis, through the news media, that the Marines were coming ashore in Kuwait. A huge amphibious force is set to go now in the Persian Gulf, and most Allied ground units have moved now up to positions from which they could launch their attacks. The landing never took place. There's nothing new about government spreading disinformation. Uh, the difference is that today, when you misinform the other side, you're also misinforming your own people. And as in other wars, once the shooting began, the military imposed strict censorship. I've laundered them so you can't really tell what I'm talking about because I don't want the Iraqis to know what I'm talking about. But trust me, trust me. Now the censorship plus the geographical context in which this particular war was happening led to the military's ability to control the images much more than is usual. I'm now going to show you a picture of the luckiest man in Iraq on this particular day. Keep your eye on the crosshairs. Right there. Look at here. Right through the crosshairs. And now in his rear view mirror. And they show up, you know, knocking on a bridge. One man got away on the bridge. Well, he isn't going to tell you, nor do I think he should, that other aircraft in other places are causing all kinds of devastation and immense casualties. <laughs> <laughs> because the U.S. military was so successful in using television, what many people saw at home was only part of the story. This war was uh, covered in the media like a video game. One saw missiles going off and uh, missiles landing and uh, 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 beautiful fireworks in the sky at night. Uh, and because of the nature of how the war was conducted and where things were happening, uh, some of the, uh, the devastating effect on Iraqi troops and some of the retreats, for example, was really not seen uh, in the bloody detail that the Vietnam War was.
In fact, the Persian Gulf War was extraordinarily swift and violent and lethal. But we saw a little of that. Instead, the images we retain, surgically precise high-tech weapons causing an almost bloodless victory, have been mistaken for the whole picture. People have come to think that when they're seeing an event broadcast live, that they're seeing the real truth. Uh, but in fact, they're seeing an impression. They're seeing something shot by some cameras placed in some places, some interviews being conducted by some reporters some bombs bursting in some air, but the impressions they see have the aura of authenticity, and that can make them even more unnervingly distorting. Adnan Khashoggi, the Saudi financier, said of the Persian Gulf War, it was like going to a movie. We paid our money, we laughed, we cried, and an hour later we had forgotten about it. And in fact, too often, what we remember most about events on live television is the electrifying immediacy of the here and now. Because we used to read or hear about important events, we had time to think about them. But now, as we watch the pictures unfold live on television, sometimes the drama, the emotion there, overwhelms our judgment. I think it discourages long-term thinking. I think it discourages uh, historical references and memory. Uh, it tends to value the immediate and the present over the long term. We're, I think, a better informed people, uh, but I think in the long run we know less because we think about it less uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's given to us just a bit too fast. There's a familiar saying that knowledge is power, but there's another one that may be more to the point, that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I'm Mike Wallace, and this is the 20th century.